welcome back, and thank you for listening to Xenozoic Xenophiles, a fan podcast devoted to the comic series Xenozoic Tales. It's a post-apocalyptic adventure series filled with Cadillacs and dinosaurs from creator, writer, and artist Mark Schultz. I'm Darren. And I'm Ruth, and this is a fan podcast. We're not affiliated with Mark Schultz, and the opinions expressed are just ours. We're doing this podcast because we enjoy reading and talking about the world of Xenozoic Tales by Mark Schultz. In this episode, we're discussing Xenozoic Tales, issue 14 from 1996. It features one story written and illustrated by Mark Schultz, and a second story written by Mark Schultz and illustrated by Steve Stiles. Our title comes from the word Xenozoic, which is part of the title of the comic. Xeno is defined as something that is strange or foreign, while Zoic refers to a geological period of time. So Xenozoic basically means strange age. And a xenophile is someone who is interested in foreign lands and foreign cultures, and that word describes us perfectly, because we're definitely interested in foreign lands and cultures just like those found in Xenozoic Tales. Of course, many of you might be familiar with this series under the title Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. That's occasionally been used for reprint collections as well as for video games, board games, and an animated TV series. The original comic series, created, written, and primarily illustrated by Mark Schultz, was published by Kitchen Sink Press under the title Xenozoic Tales for 14 issues from 1987 through 1996. Yes, that means this is the final issue. For now. Because we all know that Mark Schultz is currently working on a new Xenozoic Tales graphic novel. So that means there are more adventures of Jack and Hannah coming soon. Be sure to join the Facebook page, Mark Schultz Xenozoic Tales and Other Stories, for the latest official news and information. Flesk Publications has announced there will be a Kickstarter campaign for the new book when it's ready. More information will be released later, and we'll definitely let everyone know when it starts. And for those of you who would like to meet Mark Schultz in person, we want to mention that he will be a guest at East Coast Comics Con in New Jersey in May. If anyone's in that area, be sure to stop by and say hello to Mark. And if you would like to follow along with the issues we're covering here on our podcast, then consider picking up the collection titled Xenozoic. It contains all of the stories written and illustrated by Mark Schultz. It's a wonderful oversized book printed on high-quality paper, and you can order directly from Flesk Publications. While you're there, be sure to check out the other wonderful books they have available from a variety of talented creators. It's a wonderful site with lots of great stuff. And they have other books by Mark Schultz, too, including a beautiful portfolio collection, as well as the illustrated novella Storms at Sea, which we'll be covering on our podcast in the future. If you would like some music to listen to while reading the series, then we recommend picking up Songs from the Xenozoic Age. It's an eclectic mix of fun songs by John Chris Christensen that are inspired by the series and the CD Features album art by Mark Schultz. We enjoy sharing listener feedback and being part of the conversations with listeners on social media. Please feel free to write in any time and let us know what you think about the series. We'd love to know what you like best about the art and stories and how you first discovered Xenozoic Tales. Later in the episode, we'll share feedback and we'll provide our email address and other ways to contact us at the end of the show. Xenozoic Xenophiles is part of the Rad Adventures Network. If you enjoy the show, please consider checking out our other podcasts that are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and YouTube. Trekker Talk is a fan podcast devoted to the adventures of 23rd century bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair from the pages of the sci-fi comic Trekker by writer and artist Ron Randall. And Warlord Worlds is a fan podcast devoted to the comic creations of writer and artist Mike Grell, including The Warlord, John Sable, and Green Arrow. Mark Schultz, Ron Randall, and Mike Grell are our favorite comic creators. Their stories are filled with adventure and interesting characters, and their art is always excellent. We'll include links to those other podcasts in our show notes, but for now, let's check out this month's issue right after this message from another podcast you might enjoy. When you think of podcasts about religion, you probably think of this. But at least one religion podcast sounds more like this. I kick ass for the Lord! Dorkness to Light is a relatively geeky production in which Alan and Emily discuss topics of faith, religion, and spirituality. But we do so through the lens of pop culture, like movies, TV, and comic books, because we're nerds. Our primary focus will be on Christianity, because that's what we know best. But all religious content is on the table. Well, think about it, Scully, from vampirism to Catholicism. 
this is an occasional cast to be recorded and released as the mood strikes, with topics ranging from in-depth reviews to personal rants about some small aspect of theology or church history, because we're theological nerds. If these topics interest you, check out dorknesstolight.blogspot.com for our more regular content. Or dorknesstolight.tumblr.com for our more irregular content. Memes and puns, mostly. My bad. Dorkness to light. Often irreverent, rarely sacrilegious. Xenozoic Tales, number 14. 1996. Publisher, Dennis Kitchen. Editors, Dave Schreiner and Chris Couch. Letters, Denise Prow. Art director, Amy Brockway. Design, Kevin Leeson. Production, Jim Kitchen. Cover colors, Denise Prow. It's the 26th century. The world has undergone a great geological cataclysm causing global catastrophes. Few people survived. Those that did found themselves living in isolated tribes in a very different world and a strange ecosystem. It's a new age known as the Xenozoic Era. The cover features Jack Tenrick, Hannah Dundee, and Adua Steptoe on a rocky outcrop. Some machinery is behind them, as well as a Monolophosaurus, which is a larger relative of the Velociraptor. This is a beautiful cover that Mark has also offered as a print, and we're happy to have a copy of that print signed by Mark framed and hanging on our wall in our house. Another Swarm, written and illustrated by Mark Schultz. The story opens in the underground pits beneath Wasoon, where stockyards and slaughterhouses provide food and other resources for the city. Lord Drumheller is overseeing the transfer of a mysterious creature that was found in the marshes. While it is tied down, the crew working to move it marvels at the eight legs and single giant eye. Meanwhile, Hannah Dundee is fishing with her adopted family. While her mother and father look on, Hannah helps teach her younger sister Hephzibah techniques for using a net in the shallow water. Her foster parents are concerned about her relationship with Jack Tenrick from the City in the Sea. They want her on the side of Lord Drumheller, who has treated their family well, and they worry about what might happen to their young daughter if Hannah sides with Tenrick instead of Drumheller. As they fight among themselves, a boat arrives to take Hannah back to the city to meet with Drumheller. At the same time, Jack is poring over maps and other papers when he suddenly realizes a Dua Steptoe has snuck into his room without him realizing it, and she's brought three of her students who are learning the ways of the old blood mechanics. Jack's surprise at their great ability to sneak into his room is quickly replaced by a greater surprise when Adua tells him that Drumheller has captured a harvestman. Like Adua, Jack knows that they must free the creature, and they begin to develop a plan. Lord Balclutha, who sided with Jack following the events of the previous issue, joins the plan, along with Hannah Dundee, who arrives following her meeting with Drumheller. The group secretly enters the pits along a hidden passage known only to Adua and her students, but they are soon discovered by a shrike or monolophosaurus that is being used to guard the rocky passages. They are able to elude the dinosaur by splitting into two groups, and Jack, Hannah, and Adua make their way to the large cage where the harvestman is being kept. However, it all turns out to be a trap when they find themselves surrounded by Drumheller and several armed guards. Drumheller tells the two old blood mechanics that he knows they use the harvestmen for everything from medicines to oils to hydraulic fluid, which helps them repair and run machinery. He plans to breed the creatures for his own use, thus breaking the hold that the old blood mechanics have over the city. In response, Jack and Adua explain the importance of releasing the creature. The harvestmen are also known as cog spiders and live in the deep, deep down. They cannot survive above ground, which is why the one in the cage looks to be nearly dead. There are millions of the creatures living underground, and they actually produce oxygen and are important to the survival of all creatures. The harvestmen live in cooperation with those that still live underground. None of the creatures are ever killed by the old blood mechanics. Instead, the harvestmen deliver their dead to the underground tribes for use. It's all part of the balance of life that makes up the Machinato Vitae. All during this long debate, Hannah has been staring into the single eye of the harvestman. While everyone is arguing, 
She slowly turns and walks to the cage door release. The Harvestman emerges from the cage, but the Shrike attacks it. The two creatures battle, and while the Shrike rips one leg from the Harvestman, it is still able to climb over a cliff and down into the deeper caverns. Jack, Hannah, and Adua are able to leave safely thanks to a standoff between Balclutha's men and Drumheller's men. Back above ground, Adua takes Jack to the edge of the forest where the Grith are waiting. They tell him that Hannah has passed the test and they want her to join Jack on an expedition back to Fessenden's Doom Station that we all visited early in the series. The story threads are really starting to converge here. We see the hints of things to come as the various characters begin to make their plays for power. It's also a terrific time to see Hannah's adopted family, and then it's such an exciting end to the story when we get hints that the Grith are testing Hannah, and that they might know about her past. The Grith are always mysterious and always interesting. I like learning more about them, so it's always exciting when they appear. It's also fun to see a Dua and her students. I definitely want to know more about them. In addition to the gripping story, we also have Mark Schultz's glorious art. Every page should be framed and placed on the walls of museums, in my opinion. Looking at pages 2 and 3 together is a great example of how Mark can capture vastly different moments in time. On page 2, we have the shadowed underground caverns, with the Harvestmen being dragged through dark passages. While on page 3, we have the bright images of Hannah fishing with her adopted family under the bright sunlight. I love Jack's reaction when he is surprised by Adua and her students on page 6, as well as the panel showing Wasoon at night on page 7 with a crescent moon in the background. The attack and escape from the dinosaur on pages 12 and 13 is exciting, and the image of the Harvestman in the cage on page 14 is creepy and mysterious. Page 19 features the dramatic battle between the Harvestman and the Shrike, and I liked reading Mark's notes at the end of the issue, which dedicated this page to stop-motion special effects pioneers Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen. And I love the image of the Grith emerging from the forest at the bottom of page 21, and the image of Jack and Adua with the city in the background at the bottom of page 22. This is both an exciting and a beautiful issue. Hello, Paul. Hello. I am Dr. Herfi Stafner. Come in, come in, please. Take a seat. Take a seat. What can I do for you today? Uh, just, I just... I'm, I can't sleep. I, I, I can't focus on anything. The only thing I can think about is, like, DC events. DC events? As in the comic books? DC events? Yes, yes. The comic book events. Ooh, interesting. Uh, are we, we talking things like Crisis on Infinite Earths? Yeah, yeah, totally. That one, yeah. Uh, Infinite Crisis? Yeah, yeah, that one too. Oh, very, very. Invasion, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the uh, the Genesis? Uh, not so much. No? Oh. Okay, well, I think it's really good if you talk about the things that are troubling you in your life. So maybe you should do a podcast about this obsession. What, what, what do you call this obsession? What do you think it is? I think you're a unique case. I've not seen anything like this before in my office. I'm going to suggest that you have what we call DC OCD. What? DC OCD? You are obsessive and compulsive about your DC events. I think you should talk it out, get it out of your system via a podcast. I will help you, my friend. We shall do a podcast together about your DC OCD. Oh, okay. When I won't even start? charge you for it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I don't think I can claim you on <laughs> benefits. <clears throat> yeah, it's good. <laughs> when shall we start? Um, I'll get back to you on that. I'll check my I'll check my timetable. <laughs> cool. The Family Business, written by Mark Schultz, illustrated by Steve Stiles. <laughs> Our story opens with Vice Terhoon and Mikla and their gang ambushing and killing a dinosaur and bagging the organs to sell in the city in the sea. Vice is upbeat now that Jack Tenrick is gone because Wilhelmina Sharnhorse has lifted the market ban on selling dinosaur organs in the city. This will make everything much easier. (laughs) 
However, bitter disappointment awaits them at the City in the Sea when they take their meat to market. Now that the trade is legal, there are more hunters bringing in more meat into the city, and the price has dropped considerably because of the excess supply. And things get worse when Vice is stopped and asked for his market permit, and he learns that he has to pay 10% of his smaller earnings in taxes to the city. Vice is having none of this, so he stomps off to meet with Scharnhorst. She took good care of the Terhune family when they were trading in the black market underground, and he thinks she will do the same again. However, as Governor Scharnhorst is now caught up in the busy cycle of managing the political problems in the city and the sea, while also dealing with the resistance led by Mustafa Cairo. Vice can't even get her attention as she walks by, surrounded by dozens of other people trying to get her attention for their needs and complaints. No matter, thinks Vice Terhune, he has another plan. The story ends as he and his gang raid a remote village, stealing supplies and burning homes. He laughs to himself. If Sharnhorst thinks she has problems with the resistance, she's going to find that's nothing compared to the problems ahead for her. I really like the way these backup stories let us get a glimpse into what's going on back at the city and the sea while the main story is taking place in Wasun. Here we see one of the Terhune family who expects everything to be better now that Jack Tenrick is gone but instead he finds everything is now suddenly much more complicated. And it's really fun to see the way his devious mind quickly comes up with a way to take advantage of the situation. Sharnhorse, who he considers his great ally at the beginning of the story, has become his bitter enemy by the end. I also like the way these stories give us a chance to check in with characters we've met before. Of course, we've met various members of the Terhune family throughout the series, and you might specifically remember Vice and Mikla from the story Foul Weather back in issue 8, where Jack encountered them at an abandoned lighthouse during a huge storm. Some of my favorite art in the story includes the image of the Triceratops looking out over the ocean as the gang pulls their boat into the port to deliver the meat to market. I also like the sequence of Vice Terhune striding off to see Sharnhorse. Steve Stiles makes good use of stone archways and stairways to create nice angles and shadows during that sequence. And even though I don't like what's actually happening in the panel, I must say the image of the village burning at night with a full moon overhead on the last page is stunning. Great story. John Jones of Mars. Ten years ago, a crashing wave of light erupted across the DC Universe. A multicolored spectrum of energy bathed the cosmos in a war of light. Rage clashed against passion. Hope sought to stifle fear. Greed to choke out compassion. And in the middle of it all, the will to keep going and fight for all. Now this war has come to the surface of our planet because while the light fights, the darkness rises. Hero, villain, friend, foe, family. Across the universe, the dead have risen, and it's going to take every available podcaster to fight back. In 2016, we covered the dawn of the Justice League with Justice League Year One. In 2017, we soaked in the seminal justice. Last year, we threw it back to the Silver Age. 
But this year's JLMA podcast event covers an event that knows not the boundaries of death itself. JL May covers Blackest Night in celebration of the event's 10-year anniversary. Our coverage begins on April 30th with the podcast of OA and proceeds through the entire month of May with Chris and Reggie's Cosmic Treadmill, The Idol Head of Diablo, The Fire and Water Podcast, Head Speaks, Coffee and Comics Podcast, Longbox Crusade, Waiting for Doom, Task Force X, the Starman Manhunter Adventure Hour, the Dr. DC Podcast, the Birds of Prey Podcast, Justice's First Dawn, and ends with the Lantern Cast. So join us this May, because across the DC Universe, the dead have risen. Where will you be? Let's review who's who and what's what in Xenozoic Tales. This is the 26th century, long after a series of geological cataclysms. What is known as the City in the Sea in these stories is the island of Manhattan that is now partially submerged in the ocean. The city of Wasoon is what we know as Washington, D.C. Jack Tenrick is an old blood mechanic, one of the few people who have learned how to repair the many machines left over from the distant past. He's also a bit of a shaman. Hannah Dundee is a scientist and ambassador from Wasoon, who has come to the City and the Sea in the hopes of building cooperation between the two cities. Wilhelmina Scharnhorst was once the leader of the Moles, a group of people who prefer to live and work underground, where they search the ancient ruins under the City and the Sea. She despises the old blood mechanics, and she and Jack have little respect for each other. She has used her influence to be elected as one of the city's governors. The Grith are mysterious humanoid reptiles and are allies of both Jack and Hannah, who are two of the very few people who have ever seen the Grith. The Grith communicate telepathically with each other and talk to Jack and Hannah using the letter tiles from an old Scrabble board game. Next up is listener feedback when we share the emails and messages we've received since last time. Thanks to everyone for the comments. Your support and encouragement is great, and we sincerely appreciate everyone who took time to get in touch to share your thoughts. When our last episode posted, Paul Hicks of Waiting for Doom messaged that it's so good to have a new episode of Xenozoic Xenophiles. And Sean Ross of Secret Wars and Beyond from the Pulp to Pixel podcast, as well as Nerdy Dads, wrote, Sweet, I love this show. John Baker of 3 If By Space wrote, Hey, just listen to Xenozoic Xenophiles episode 15 and enjoyed the proverbial heck out of it. Your passion for the work of Mark Schultz is palpable, and I definitely enjoy your walk through a particular issue, panel, or other aspect of his work. Thanks for sharing your unique perspective on Mark's wonderful work. Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network let us know he thought the last issue we covered was a fun story. Chris Butler wrote, Just discovered you guys. Love the podcast. Great job. Thanks, Chris. We're glad you found the show and appreciate you taking the time to write. And we'll wrap up feedback with a new iTunes review from Reggie Hancock of the Cosmic Treadmill Podcast. I never gave it a second thought until I heard these guys wax enthusiastic about it. Now I grab copies of Cadillacs and Dinosaurs whenever I see them. Terrific, high-quality podcast. Thank you very much, Reggie, for that awesome review. We sincerely appreciate it. And in closing, we want to thank Mark Schultz and John Fless for the amazing time we had at Baltimore Comic Con since the last episode. We were able to hang out with Mark and John some during the weekend, and Ruth even helped sell a couple of items at their table when it was particularly busy. We also picked up some terrific prints for ourselves, and we were fortunate to watch Mark sketch in a couple of copies of the Conan collection that he was selling at his table. Several others in the podcast community were at the con as well, and it was fun to have them stop by and check out Mark's table while we were there. Nice. It was a fantastic weekend, and we thank you for sharing it with us, Mark. Next, we want to extend our thanks to everyone who supported the show on social media since last episode. These are people who commented or shared posts from us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, and we sincerely appreciate all the support. Before we start, let me say if we miss a name, just let us know and we'll correct it next time. And please forgive us if we mispronounce your name. Just write to let us know and we'll be sure to correct that next episode. The 20th Century Geek Podcast with Scott Weatherly, Al Sedano of Resurrections and Adam Warlock and Thanos Podcast, Austin Appleby, Brian Mulvey, Carlos Avieto, 
Chris Franklin of Supermates and the JLU cast. Chris Carnes of Bat Books for Beginners and the Professor Frenzy Show. Chris Sheehan of the Cosmic Treadmill Podcast and the blog Chris is on Infinite Earths. Clinton Robinson of the Coffee and Comics blog and podcast. Comics in the Golden Age with Mike and Chris. Creator Talks with Christopher Calloway. Cullen Stapleton from the Worst Comics Podcast Ever. Derek William Crabb of the Fan Holes Podcast and History of Comics on Film. Doc Strange. Dr. G. Man of Nerdology of the Pulp to Pixel Podcast. The Drunken Dork Podcast. Ed and Terry Moore of Teal Productions. Elmo Rocco. Eva Barcello. Gene Hendricks from The Hammer Strikes and Anime Freaks. Jerry Aserno. Jerry Green of The Professor Frenzy Show and Bat Books for Beginners. Giles Kawaii. Glenn Crane. Green Lantern HG. Jeff Peterson. Jeffrey Brown. Joe Crawford of the blog for the non-discerning reader. Joe Coffey. John Baker, who does sci-fi TV reviews at 3F by Space. John Holloway of the worst comic podcast ever. Julio Serenena. Justice's First Dawn with Mike Peacock. Karen Williams of the Sweet Between the Pages blog. Larry Munoz. Laurel Phillips, a.k.a. Mountainflower. Longbox Crusade podcast with Pat, Jared, Jason, and Delvin. Lorenzo Palmero. Make My Comic Rare. Marco Parra. Mark Adams of Mark Smith's podcast. Mark Sweeney from the ITG blog and podcast and comics couplets. Martin Gray of the blog Too Dangerous for a Girl. Matthew Ward. Michael Pajukonos. Michael Sincavage. Mike Mayo. Nicholas Prom of Comic Reflections. Politics of Waiting for Doom and the DC OCD podcast. Peter Noga. Poptonica Arts. Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Randy Andrews of Soundtrack Alley and the Gen 13 Files. Reggie Hancock of the Cosmic Treadmill Podcast and Weird Science DC. Rolled Spine Podcast. Ryan Davis. Scott Connor. Scott Morris. Steve Bryant. Talk Nerdy to Me. Tiago Oliveira. Tim Price. Tom Agnetti. Wendy Freeman of the Podcast Double Page Spread. And a big thanks to Mark Schultz, Xenozoic Tales, and Other Stories Facebook page for sharing our episodes. <laughs> Before we go, we want to provide our contact information. Please let us know your thoughts through email, Facebook, or Twitter. If you want to contact us directly or have something you would like to have read on the show, then please send an email to xenozoicxenophiles at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under the name Xenozoic Xenophiles, and you can also visit xenozoicxenophiles.com for links to our social media pages. You can listen to our show through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and all of our episodes are always available at xenozoicxenophiles.com. You can also find the show on YouTube as part of the Rad Adventures Podcast Network. That's Rad, R-A-D, which is short for Ruth and Darren. On the Rad Adventures YouTube channel, you'll find all of the episodes of all of our podcasts, including Xenozoic Xenophiles, as well as Trekker Talk about 23rd Century Bounty Hunter Mercy St. Clair by Ron Randall, and Warlord Worlds about the comic creations of Mike Grell, including The Warlord, John Sable, and Green Arrow. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. Every review helps the podcast to be more likely to show up in search results. And on YouTube, we hope you'll subscribe to the channel and give us some likes on the videos. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you'll come back next time for another new episode of Xenozoic Xenophiles. Xenozoic Xenophiles is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. For more information, please visit comicspodcasts.com. We are not affiliated with Mark Schultz or the various companies that have published the series. The views expressed on the show are solely ours. Music is taken from the album, Movie Tunes, Background Music, Songs and Loops, Volume 2. We make no money from this podcast and no copyright infringement is intended. <laughs>